for joining us. And Nadine, thank you so much for being here at the 2023 Forbidden Courses. I'm really excited to chat with you today. I'm delighted to be here, Audrey, and I am so happy to meet and have the opportunity to engage with all of you. Uh, are you enjoying your program so far? <laughs> well, I don't know. Would I think in this group, if you weren't, you would, how many of you are having a really bad time? <laughs> well, we'll, t we'll test their free speech bona fides. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And we want to start by encouraging all of you to participate with us. We really want today to be a conversation. So please don't hesitate to raise your hand with a question, with a comment, respond to others in the room. To get us started, though, I would love to hear more from Nadine about her interest in free speech and her amazing background. Well, thank you so much, Audrey, with your amazing background. And I do want to underscore what Audrey said. I requested that this be as interactive as possible, that uh, rather than my doing a lecture, which I could easily talk about free speech for at least three hours or more, uh, but I really, it's a, an ish, it's a con con constellation of issues, right, that um, is in the news all the time, I think is on our minds all the time. There are so many different dimensions that I thought the best way to share this precious time with such an important group is to hear and discuss with you about the particular aspects of free speech that are of most urgent concern to you. So I really hope that the vast majority of this is going to be your questions and your comments. But uh, Audrey um, and I agreed that we would kick it off and warm you up uh, by her asking a question, the first of which is about my interest in free speech, which goes back as seriously as far as I can remember, uh, long before I had any idea of law or terminology. I, like I think many human beings from what I read of, of history, uh, just had an innate sense of the importance of self-expression and chafing at restraints, whether they came from my parents or from my teachers, and there were, there were plenty uh, from both sources. So I was thrilled when I discovered that there actually are some legal protections and some th steps that I could take, not only to protect my own free speech rights, but um, those of others. So um, for most of my adult career, I have been actively engaged in civil liberties and human rights, and I'm fully committed to the entire agenda of organizations where I was a leader, including the ACLU and Human Rights Watch, of defending all fundamental freedoms for all people. And I spent many, many years, you know, constantly debating and advocating on the whole agenda uh, from A to Z or abortion to zero tolerance, to give uh, two concrete examples. But starting in about 2015, it became increasingly clear to me that freedom of speech was in very serious trouble. Uh, from both ends of the political spectrum facing new waves of illiberalism and of particular concern was that the threats to free speech were coming, and I can put this in the present tense as well, continue to come from institutions and sectors of society where traditionally speech had been the most prized and the most protected. Starting with academia, including journalism, publishing, entertainment, librarianship, even, dare I say, civil liberties and human rights organizations. Um, and, uh, you know, for every generalization is, of course, somewhat oversimplified, but it has become increasingly clear to me from uh, anecdotal and survey evidence and, and comparing notes with other people um, that there is a, a demographic split in our society about uh, classical liberal values, including free speech, enlightenment values. All of you are the exception, but 
Um, sadly and dismayingly, younger cohorts are the ones that are the least protective in all of these institutions. And I can use the one that I know the best, the ACLU, sec second best, academia. Um, again, surveys show that you know, the um, critical factor in separating a strong support for free speech from a, at best, skepticism, at worst, hostility, is really age, you know, not gender, not race, not politics, religion, uh, anything else. So uh, it came clear to me as a, as a lifelong teacher and advocate that I and others who had tried to educate and persuade about the importance of free speech for everyone, no matter what you're, no matter who you are, and no matter what you believe, that we hadn't done a good enough job of making the case. And I decided that the most important thing I could do with the rest of my life was to uh, uh, try to make that case more persuasively than had been done before. But in the spirit of one of my heroes, John Stuart Mill, to keep my mind open to the best of my flawed human ability to um, grapple seriously with the strong arguments that are being made against free speech. And I defend it, I continue to defend it, because so far, I continue to be persuaded that the robust free speech protections we have, for example, under the First Amendment um, are the best way, or let's, shall we say the least bad way, to advance not only individual liberty, but also equality and all other human rights and democracy. Uh, but I welcome the opportunity to be challenged in uh, a new book that I wrote last year, which is going to be published in the fall. I actually started with a chapter uh, about the 12 hardest, most challenging, and most common arguments that are made against free speech. I really uh, welcomed the opportunity to uh, test my own views and expand my own views by, by grappling with those. And I very much hope that you'll throw at me what you consider strong arguments and um, difficult questions, and we can work through them together. One of the reasons why I, I really enjoy the interactive format is I'm constantly learning. Um, the reason I was able to write my, my, my last book quite quickly was it was pretty much a distillation of conversations and discussions I'd had with audiences like this all over the country. I harvested the questions and you know, sat down at the laptop and, and out they came with, with answers. I love how you just explained that because I think the term freedom of speech gets thrown around a lot these days and it's really helpful to specify freedom toward what ends and especially on college campuses, I found that students would sometimes say, oh, I sure, I support free speech, but I also want to live in a community with shared values. I want people to be kind. And there was this suggestion that there's an inherent tension between free speech and unfettered, open, fearless inquiry and actually crafting a really lively, happy community. And mm -hmm. if I, I wonder if you can speak a little to that. Yes, one of the reasons why free speech is so under siege, I believe, is that uh, when people think about free speech and when they criticize it, they tend to be using a caricatured, distorted version of free speech. Uh, a show on National Public Radio called On the Media twice within the past couple of years has had hour-long segments that purportedly were about free speech uh, on which they had not a single 
expert on free speech who was defending it. Every single person on the program was somebody who was demonizing it and caricaturing it, uh, which by the way, I thought, well, I, I, will, I will organize a counter program. I didn't have access to NPR, but I organized uh, a couple of podcasts on the uh, FIRE website. Matt Taibbi was one of my debate partners. Um, and and the, the over and over and over again in those attacks on free speech, um, there were statements that, oh, you know, people who defend free speech say that free speech is absolute. They won't admit of any exceptions whatsoever, and they're so unreasonable, they deny that free speech can ever do any harm. Well, no, and no, and no. You know, the, the more I delved into free speech law uh, in the past uh, number of years and in, in writing the, the recent book, the more respect I have come to have for modern First Amendment law, when I say modern, starting in the 1960s, because really, um, until that point, freedom of speech existed on paper, but not in reality. No coincidence, the United States Supreme Court, under the leadership of Chief Justice Earl Warren, the famous progressive Warren Court, um, defended free speech and and started to enshrine what we consider now the modern free speech protective principles in the context of the civil rights movement. Case after case after case in one area of free speech law after another arose in the factual context of civil rights demonstrators who were being persecuted and prosecuted because of trying to exercise what we now consider to be fundamental free speech principles under the First Amendment, but had never been upheld by the United States Supreme Court. Lately, I've seen quoted over and over and over again, so you may have heard it, um, John, the former Congressman John Lewis, who was a leader uh, as a student of the civil rights movement, saying uh, with his characteristic eloquence, without freedom of speech, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. You know, and many people know that Martin Luther King wrote a famous letter from the Birmingham jail. How many of you know why he was in jail? What was he imprisoned for? What was his crime? The crime was trying to exercise what we now consider to be probably the core First Amendment right, the right to protest government policies and to petition the government, right, another aspect of the First Amendment, for a redress of grievances, the violation of civil rights. But um, the modern Supreme Court First Amendment principles, which began to um, develop in the 1960s and have become stronger and stronger since then, by the way, Audrey, with pretty much unanimous support across the spectrum um, of all of the modern Supreme Court justices since the 1960s who have obviously differed with each other profoundly on most issues of constitutional law, the court is very deeply split, you know, five to four, even more fractionated than that. But strikingly, when you look at their cases that are upholding freedom for even the most controversial speech that polls show that, you know, pluralities and even majorities of the public want to suppress, disinformation, hate speech, extremist speech, the justices are almost always unanimous or all but unanimous. And I started asking myself, you know, why is that? Why this disparity between um, the Supreme Court on the one hand and the public on the other hand? Obviously, what the justices have that most members of the public do not is a knowledge of what free speech principles actually are, what free speech law actually is, and a knowledge of the history that led to it. What was the actual experience when we didn't have 
such robust speech protective law? What have we gained uh, as a result of, of that change? So um, to, to, to bring it around to um, uh, the point that I started toward and I've detoured, I started by saying uh, f modern free speech law, the more you learn about it, uh, my bottom line is the more common sense it makes or the more it accords with common sense um, perspectives. The principles, although very complex, and the doctrine, as you know, you've studied it, has you know many tributaries and caveats and so forth, but in general, it does allow government to punish and outlaw the speech that is the most dangerous, that causes the most harm, while at the same time, it bars government from censoring or restricting, um, from engaging in the censorship that is the most dangerous. And if I can just amplify on that. So the censorship that is the most dangerous, and let me start the other way around, the speech that is the most dangerous is often described with the phrase, uh, the, the emergency principle. Speech that imminently, directly causes or threatens certain serious, specific, imminent harm, right? There's a direct, tight, causal connection between the speech and harm, and direct temporal connection. The Supreme Court has recognized several subcategories of speech that satisfy that emergency principle. One that's been in the news quite a lot since January 6th was intentional incitement of imminent violence, where the speaker intends to incite violence that's likely to happen imminently. Flip to the most dangerous censorship, and that is when the government's reason for restricting the speech is not because of a tight and direct causal and temporal connection between the speech and specific harm, but rather solely because of dislike or disagreement, disapproval of the message, the idea, the viewpoint, or because there is a more speculative, indirect connection between the speech and potential harm. So those two principles, the emergency principle and what we call the viewpoint neutrality or content neutrality principle, government may never suppress speech solely based on disapproval of the content. But when you consider the speech in its overall context, and in all the facts and circumstances, it presents an emergency, then government may restrict the speech. And I think that just accords with common sense. And I wonder if we can talk a little bit about practical tips that maybe we can all employ. If you hear speech that is really upsetting, that's wrong, do you have suggestions for how best we approach that speech with poise as opposed to shouting down Oh, this speakers. is, you know, thank you so much, Audrey. It's a very individualized uh, decision uh, for each of us, how, what goal we want to accomplish, and it might vary uh, very much depending on what the um, context is in which you hear the speech. A term that lawyers often use to embrace the infinite panoply of reactions we could have other than censorship to speech we disagree with is counter speech. It doesn't necessarily mean raising your voice. It may mean ignoring it. It may mean turning your back. It may mean walking away. Um, so if, for example, you want, and I think you gave the example of you want to avoid being upset yourself, um, then the best thing to do might well be to, uh, to ignore it and to not allow the speaker to affect your own sense of self. I'd like to quote uh, my friend and colleague, Jonathan Rauch, 
who uh, were, is a fellow at the Brookings Institution and uh, you know lifelong crusader for same-sex marriage and uh, gay rights and a wonderful intellectual freedom defender. But I'm going to give you a trigger warning because I've been told at, in other audiences that I, I'm not allowed to quote this passage from John's book. I disagree with that, so I am going to quote it. Um, but um, he was talking about how if somebody says something that is um, insulting, including homophobic, phobic, he's a, a gay man, it's, he doesn't necessarily have to feel insulted or disempowered or degraded by that. And I actually, in my book on hate speech, I think I quote Eleanor Roosevelt, a great human rights um, champion, uh, saying something like, nobody can hurt your feelings unless you give them permission to do that, right? It's how you right. perceive it. And so John's great line was, um, if somebody calls me a fucking faggot, I don't process that, that I'm a fucking faggot. I process that as she needs counseling. So in other words, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That's a heartening response compared to the last time. I had this long colloquy with somebody who said he could say it, but I couldn't. But um, you know, I think she was assuming I'm not gay, and therefore I couldn't say it. But um, so you know, we have to have. Uh, and, and psychologists, including Jonathan Haidt, I don't know how many of you read, have read The Coddling of the American Mind, some of you have, co-authored by John Haidt, a social psychologist, cognitive psychologist, and, um, and, and Greg Lukianoff, the CEO of FIRE. And there, one major point is precisely from the perspective of the emotional and psychological well-being of people, censorship is not the way to go. I mean, put aside all the First Amendment free speech principles. If you care about somebody's psychological health, it is counterproductive to convince them that they should be harmed and to cater to the harm, but rather there are techniques including cognitive behavior therapy that all of us can use to increase our self-confidence and our resilience and to let the words bounce off us, you know. Going off of that, do we have any questions or comments? Or comments, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Ian? Uh, Hi, Ian. Thank you for speaking with us. And Audrey, thank you for hosting. Um, my question is, I was reading recently James Burnham's book, The Suicide of the West. I don't know if you're familiar. I haven't with read it. Well, one of the premises he lays out is that in a liberal society, we defend free speech of everybody, and that in some ways gives an advantage to those of us among us that are illiberal, because in sort of a game theoretic way, they have an advantage in that they don't have to allow us to speak, but we have to allow them to speak. I was wondering if you could kind of comment on that idea and if that makes any sense in the context of like where we find ourselves today. It, Ian, it doesn't make sense from a legal perspective because all views are equally entitled to freedom of speech, no matter how illiberal they are. I mean, one of the points I make in, in constantly is no matter what your ideas are, including ideas against free speech, you need freedom of speech in order to be able to advocate them. So. Um, now, if you're going to talk about um, other instruments of censorship, which we unfortunately have in the private sector, which are not susceptible to First Amendment standards, um, then there is a disparity. I mean, if all the social media platforms, let's say all the mainstream ones, share a certain perspective, then disproportionately they are consistently going to be suppressing uh, views that are antithetical to theirs, which is, I guess, you know, a re a hopefully capitalism will um, enter to the rescue and new platforms will emerge that will, um, will uh, prefer other perspectives or maybe even a, a more neutral free speech perspective. But government is equally disabled. Um, so a lot of us like to say that there's a golden rule to free speech. And this is a paraphrase of the First Amendment viewpoint neutrality principle that you have to defend freedom for the speech that you loathe 
or there's not going to be freedom of speech for the speech that you love, and vice versa. My name's Tobias. Tobias, hi. Thank, thank you also for being here. Uh, so I'm not an expert on free speech, but you are. And I, uh, a lot of the time uh, when I'll be discussing these ideas with friends, they'll bring up these counterpoints that I don't, I, I'm not really able to muffle through. And one of them is if someone is, you know, th there are lots of campus talks that happen at universities where protesters will come and shout to stop that person from speaking. Uh, I think Matt Walsh is a great example of this. And one uh, counterpoint to free speech that my friends would give is, well, it's the free speech of the protesters yelling above that person. So given your expertise, could you explain how that doesn't fit into the law or you know, the definition yeah. so that next time I can speak against them? <laughs> I hate to put you on the spot, but if you would like, I'd love to hear your best answer to it, and then hopefully, but if you, if you don't feel, if you don't want to do that, uh, that's fine with me too. Uh, I remember seeing like a tweet from Paul Graham who tried to explain why it wasn't, that wasn't acceptable. Um, don't, don't worry about it. Does anybody else want to? You want to call on a volunteer? Yeah, you're the closest yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah. What you have to say, what you have to say, uh, then it's not really freedom of speech. It's, it's a zoo. Okay. And <laughs> I see another. You should call on people, Audrey. Sorry. Yeah. No. Feel free to call on people. Oh no. You, I would rather okay. you do it. <laughs> um, yeah. In the second row there. Yeah. Go ahead. Would it be considered censorship at that point? If you're not letting them speak, uh, would that be then censorship and not free speech? Okay, and do you mind telling me your names? You Johan. were, I'm sorry? Johan. Johan, and you are? Eddie. 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 Anybody else want to chime in? Well, these, I think you both, oh, sorry, somebody in the back. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, to Johan's point, I agree that uh, it's not speech if it's noise. It's literally, the definition is that it's incomprehensible. Okay, okay. so one, let's take one more and then I'll, I'll try to add my two cents for what they're worth. Uh, hi, my name's Sherry. Um, I just wanted to say that free speech actually constitutes two parts, the right of the speaker to speak and also the right of the person who wants to listen to hear. Brilliant. Yeah, these are all really, really good points. Um, so let me kind of wrap them together and distill it. You have a right to engage in protest. That is absolutely correct, and I would fervently defend the right of protest as long as it is non-disruptive and peaceful. Once it crosses the line to interfere, to impose a, let's say, a substantial interference with not only the speaker's right to convey information and ideas, but as Sherry rightly says, the other part of freedom of speech is the audience's right to hear information and ideas, that constitutes um, a zoo, as uh, Johan put it, or censorship, as, um, as, as Eddie put it. Um, so peaceful, non-disruptive protests certainly can consist of holding signs, turning your backs, wearing t-shirts, even hissing, booing, you know, heckling for a short amount of time. But when it gets to the point that um, you are making it either impossible to hear the speaker, or in some cases the speaker is actually escorted out of the event for fear of security uh, and safety, that obviously has crossed the line into disruptive, um, non-protected protest. There's a term that was coined by a u great University of Chicago. I'm looking at Audrey because she's a proud graduate of the University of Chicago. I know there are a couple UC students here. Um, Harry Calvin, a great free speech scholar, and he wrote a um, groundbreaking book about the connection 
tension between the civil rights movement and the Supreme Court's projection of the First Amendment, which I alluded to earlier. He coined the term heckler's veto. If we allow hecklers to, in effect, veto the rights of the audience members and the speaker alike, they are taking over the sensorial function. And that was a tactic that was used, especially throughout the Deep South during the Civil Rights Movement. There was case after case that went to the Supreme Court where the local sheriff and the other local officials said, well, we had to stop this march from going forward, or we had to stop this demonstration, or we had to stop this sit-in because there were rumblings, there was discontent, people were, the audience was threatening violence, and the Supreme Court said, no, your obligation, government, is to protect the speaker. You've got to protect the speaker against the violence and against the disruption. And one of the sad failures at many uh, you know, edu so-called educational institutions, such as Yale Law School, that was a dig, um, um, you know, is the failure to enforce not only free speech principles, but the university's own rules and the failure to discipline students and others who violate those rules. Because once you know that you can get away with interfering with free speech um, with impunity, then it's an incentive to keep doing it in the future. Does that help you, Tobias? So for example, a, a climate change protest is very loud, mm -hmm. at least the one as I've been to in Montreal. Mm -hmm. and But it's not disruptive because it's not stopping anyone's right to free If it's not free. so noisy that it interferes with the uh, proceedings, that's fine. So for example, if they're um, in a separate room or they're out in the hall or you know they're, they're, they're speaking quietly, that's okay. And, and so the non-disruptive standard is what we lawyers would call a content or viewpoint neutral standard. Even if they were cheering on the speaker, right, saying we love you, well, if the, you know, no matter what the message is, if it interferes with the ability literally to hear the speaker, uh, that becomes unprotected. Now in fairness, uh, as with all First Amendment law, you have standards and then you have the question of how do they apply in particular facts and circumstances. There is no bright line distinction between disruptive and non-disruptive. For example, one of the very first law school shout downs was uh, at CUNY Law School of uh, Josh Blackman who teaches at, uh, in Texas. And um, he was interrupted by, uh, for, I think he was supposed supposed to speak for about an hour. There was an hour long event and the protest went on something like 20 minutes. Same thing happened at Yale Law School recently. Is 20 minutes enough of an interruption um, that it would be considered disruptive or non-disruptive? Arguably, pe reasonable people can disagree, but in many of the cases we've seen, it's very clear. You know, the speaker literally can't proceed at all. So, non-disruptive and non-violent. Those are yes. the two quick. Things. And that's common sense, right? You know, you have the right to protest as long as it doesn't interfere with my right to speech. And interference is not you're saying something that I dislike, but you're literally stopping me from making my point. And Tobias, I wonder if your question can help me reconcile something I've been struggling with lately, which is that I think in order to succeed, a community needs some common mores. We need some agreed upon values to bring us together. And sometimes I worry, and I tried to get at this in my question earlier, sometimes I worry that if we have unfettered freedom, then we struggle to form these cohesive bonds with one another. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what others think because I think the counter argument to my own kind of budding fears may be what you just led us to, which is that free speech practiced civilly and correctly may lead us together toward agreement, which is what we so need, that maybe we do need free speech in order to reach agreement as a community and it's all it's all connected. So I'd be interested to hear what others have to think about that. 
or any other questions too, feel free to join in. My name is Jonathan. I'm uh, from Northeastern University, and there's actually a neuroscientist out of Northeastern University, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett. Oh, right, yeah. So uh, I'm sure you're familiar with her argument, but uh, uh, just for the crowd, um, uh, she makes the argument that uh, certain speakers should be limited on campus, such as uh, that are self-proclaimed uh, provocateurs. So she uses an example, Milo My Yiannopoulos, should maybe not be invited, but Charles Murray should because he's open to debate. And her argument for this is that certain speech is violence because it creates chronic stress within an individual. Um, I wanted to hear your thought about that and uh, uh, whether or not there is some type of biological argument for uh, limiting free speech on a campus. Yeah, well, t thank you so much, Jonathan. You made two points. The, the more important one, uh, they're both important, but I think the, the, the one that you focused on, um, I have not read her scholarship in detail, but she did have an op-ed in the New York Times that I think was a response to the coddling of the American mind, and then Jonathan and, and Greg responded to her. But what was really interesting about her argument was she actually acknowledges, as seems to be common among social psychologists, that. Uh, there is a positive kind of stress, right? And then there's a negative kind of stress. And she even said, even in that piece, um, if you are exposed to, you know, occasional temporary negative words and negative, hateful, traumatic ideas, that's actually positive. You know, in that sense, she's agreeing with um, Greg and John. But she said, if it's, she didn't even say if it's chronic, she said when it is chronic and ongoing and perpetual as it is on campus. She was making a factual assertion that our campuses are just hotbeds of insensitivity and offensiveness and every kind of uh, you know, ism and obia that there can possibly be. I, I pity you if that's the way Northeastern really is. But um, I, I'm saying that somewhat sardonically because I think colleges are, to their credit, doing an excellent job of promoting civility and inclusivity and DEI and belonging even more than they're doing a positive job on the whole in promoting diversity of ideas and free speech. Um, so she is drawing a factual distinction. And um, I think what's really important is to underscore the, the commonality of the agreement that if managed in a certain constructive way, and if we are all empowered to respond to or to ignore even hateful or provocative ideas, that that can be a positive experience for our mental and, and psychological health. The, the subordinate point that I think is also worth stressing is that nobody has a right to be invited to speak on campus, right? Here you are in forbidden courses. It's a wonderful, limited opportunity to, you know, with a limited amount of time, a limited number of hours in the day, a limited number of, of days. I didn't have a right to be invited to address this audience any more than Milo Yiannopoulos has the right. It's a limited resource. And I think those of us who are engaged in the educational process should be very deliberate and intentional about how we allocate those scarce resources. Uh, I do, and so to that extent, I completely agree with her that, and, and good for her for saying Charles Murray could contribute on many campuses that is not, that would be a very unpopular uh, position. But to me, if it's somebody whose ideas are influential, um, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you think those ideas are evil. In fact, it's even more important to give fat members of the campus community an opportunity uh, to engage with and to try to shed light on the flaws and, and the shortcomings. 
I, I, I started a dialogue or an email exchange with, I'll call her Lisa, even though I don't know her, um, as a result of her, because um, I quoted her in my book, and I think somebody, I think she may have complained that she thought I was quoting her out of context, and which I didn't want to do, and I offered to, you know, we had a pretty constructive exchange, and I suggested that maybe she and I could do a dialogue together. She never responded to that. In the front row. Hi, my name is Bryn. It's wonderful to meet you and learn from you this afternoon. Um, yesterday, we had the honor of listening to both um, Barry Weiss and Michael Schellenberger um, give, you know, give their talks about the topics that they they were discussing, and they were talking about um, some different censorship of ideas in all kinds of realms, media, government, social media, newspapers, they covered the whole gamut. Um, and I know that's like freedom of press, but I think kind of what they're both of the, they were both making the point that there's a lot of self-censoring that results from that in our speech um, because in conversations with each other, um, we feel like certain topics are kind of taboo or we shouldn't bring them up because they're only going to cause conflict based on what we see um, happening in these press realms. So um, I'm wondering, are like freedom of press and freedom of speech like inextricably linked? Like, do you think they're almost kind of the same thing or, and then how do we kind of push back against that in some constructive ways and not just saying, oh, down with the media or something like yeah. that because that's not actually very constructive. Yeah. Um, on, you know, again, two, two excellent interwoven points on, on, the, on one of them about self-censorship. Um, you may self-censor uh, now, but um, how many of you have engaged in self-censorship in your classes, not saying something uh, because of fear that it would lead to retaliation or shaming or shunning? Yeah, it's, it, it seems like a smaller number than, so you may be fearless, more fearless than most people or more reckless than most people or you go to more tolerant campuses because survey after survey shows that um, the substantial majority across the ideological spectrum are engaging in, in, in self-censorship. Now, you know, um, uh, I said because of fear. One way to think of self-censorship is that it is a form of freedom of speech, which includes not only the right to choose what we will say, but also the right to choose what not to say. And there are all kinds of reasons. I think going back to your really important points, um, um, Audrey, about we want to be kind, we want to be civil. So if you can express an idea in a way that is more constructive uh, and more polite, you should do that. And all of I, as a teacher, as an advocate, I'm always searching for a way to communicate most effectively, which means not saying a lot of things as well as saying a lot of things. But if the reason that you self-censor is because of fear that your idea, here we're going back to that central notion of viewpoint neutrality, it's the idea that is gonna be offensive controversial and we don't want to risk the um, the you know shaming shunning distraction inconvenience I engage in that all the time and I have to tell you even my you know strongest student friends who support free speech including this undergraduate at the University of Chicago I was telling you about um, she said that she and, and the University of Chicago recently came out and FIRE did a survey, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, did a very detailed survey of campus climate on free speech, working together with College Pulse, and it wasn't just anecdotal. I mean, they looked at, um, they did very detailed surveys of faculty and students. They also looked at the policies, they looked at enforcement of policies, um, they looked at all 
all articles in the student newspaper and the general press. And they, out of 203 campuses, they ranked the University of Chicago as being the most hospitable to free speech. And my friend there said that she and other students, before they open their mouths in class or in the student cafeteria or anywhere else, say, is it worth it? Right? Is, is, it, is it, it what I can gain going to be worth what I can lose? I have more to say on your second question, but somebody is eager to, inter, to intervene. Just very briefly. And what's your name? Uh, David. Mm -hmm. so, so these surveys that you mentioned, is there any like time series data on that? By that I mean like, you know, have they been done over the, like every five years, 10 years? And if so, how has it changed? And if not, how can you like kind of show this? Yeah, that's a, a new phenomenon, and not yeah. just like kind of a base rate fallacy situation. Yeah, that's a really excellent question, and I believe the answer is yes, albeit within a fairly short time period. Uh, so I, going back to 2015, so that's that's eight years, and you can take a look at the at the fire website where all of the data is there in very granular basis. Um, but to get to the, your second question, Bryn, about the connection between free freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Um, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. Then it's got a couple of clauses about religion uh, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And most of us have learned in construing language that, especially in a constitution where every word should count, that they wouldn't have added or press unless it was having a distinct meaning, right? Well, we would be wrong insofar as the Supreme Court has consistently said that the press, uh, what it, you know, the institutional press, the media, uh, professional journalists have exactly the same free speech rights under the Constitution as the rest of us. And there have been attempts to give more protection to the press, for example, that members of the press should have special access to certain government institutions or proceedings, or that they should have a reporter's privilege. And the Supreme Court has universally, uh, un un consistently uh, rejected those arguments, among other things, recognizing a practical uh, problem, which has become more pronounced in the era of the internet. What's the distinction? between the press and the rest of us. Fortunately now, thanks to the positive side of online media, all of us have far more power than members of the press did throughout most of our, our history. Um, but the, you know, I thought when you mentioned Barry and, and Michael that you would be talking about the Twitter files because they were so intimately involved in that. And I, 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 I do want to say something about that, uh, going back to um, the very first question that, that, that I got, um, which is that even though the First Amendment does not constrain private sector actors. They are free to platform or deplatform whatever speaker or view they choose to. If there is a sufficient relationship between the government and the private sector platform, such that the government is you know, coercing or coordinating with or pressuring or inducing collaborating with, conspiring with the private sector platform uh, to engage in restricting certain speakers or certain perspectives, that raises serious First Amendment problems. The, and again, this is a matter of common sense. The government should not be able to do an end run around its own First Amendment responsibilities by deputizing or delegating its sensorial powers to private sector actors. And one of the reasons that the Twitter files were so uh, disturbing is that there is a lot of evidence that there was a lot of collusion between a lot of government agencies and officials and these private sector platforms. You know, that you have government officials pressuring the takedown 
of certain speakers and certain perspectives that are inconsistent with government policy. And we now have a lot of lawsuits pending, which are, it's again, as with a lot of First Amendment um, uh, matters, it's very fact specific. But there's, you know, there are enough facts there for courts to inquire whether the sensorial deep platformings by Twitter, Facebook, and so forth should be treated as government action in violation. Because the, I should start by saying this, the kinds of alleged disinformation about COVID and the election and so forth um, that have been taken off these private platforms, government, if government tried to suppress any of that expression, there's no debate that that would clearly violate the First Amendment. There's no First Amendment exception for disinformation or speech that is critical of government policies on COVID or anything else. Hi, I'm Johnny. Uh, in that light, Twitter files, Twitter, Elon Musk, assuming he's rooted out all the intelligence agency by now. Um, <laughs> there was a few hiccups there, I'm, I understand. Um, you know, it was revealed with maybe the Matt Walsh what is woman documentary being posted on Twitter. Elon Musk reiterated an idea that was before him arriving, but he's now decided to take on the freedom of speech but not reach in terms of, you know, sitting next to advertising and, and those things. I understand that's probably not a, you know, an issue legally. It's his own platform. He's private and all that. Um, is there any legal instance in which that is a concept that can be brought to bear against the law? And also, what's your personal opinion about his kind of attempt to walk the line with that one. Yeah, um, so Johnny, you're exactly right that um, there's no First Amendment remedy absent showing that this was a result of government pressure, as I explained in general. But certainly, if it were the government, um, the First Amendment is violated not only by absolute suppression, by you know prior restraint or criminal punishment after the fact, but even by a restriction. So deamplifying, uh, putting a stigmatizing label on it, um, anything that reduces literally, as you say, and as Musk has said, the reach of the message is an abridgment of freedom of speech. That, by the way, is the premise underlying the very controversial Supreme Court decisions, which I completely support, um, outlawing restrictions on what's called campaign finance, spending money in support of or opposition to a candidate or an issue. Uh, the rationale that the Supreme Court used, and by the way, this basic premise is something that 100% of the justices have agreed on, that limiting the amount of money that you can spend to advance a message necessarily limits the extent to which you can communicate your message. It is an abridgment of free speech. Where the justices disagree with each other is where uh, is there a sufficient justification in terms of promoting some countervailing uh, goal. Um, uh, and then your second question was about, uh, I think you had three questions, right? Was um, what can we do about it, right? If there's no First Amendment remedy, I think that's, as I suggested earlier, other people have to create other platforms. Many of us uh, were encouraged. I mean, uh, there was so much horror when Musk uh, announced that he was going to be acquiring Twitter and that he was really going to enforce free speech. That sent shockwaves uh, throughout the established media and it was something that sent joy through me. Um, but uh, he didn't live up to it, and I defend his, his right to make that choice. Uh, but I surely wish that there were other platforms that would, in, in my ideal world, each of us would be able to find a platform that accorded with our own preferences or you know what my friends um, who specialize in these issues at uh, my favorite organization that works on them is EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And they combine a knowledge of technology with really robust commitment to First Amendment. And their engineers say that um, we can use interoperable you know, programming to allow 
now that each platform should be required to allow each of us to have an intermediary that would uh, use exactly the filtering that's consistent with our own personal preferences. That to me would be ideal. Any responses to that or further questions? You know, we have so many questions, that are hands that are up now, which is wonderful. Maybe we could take a group and I can self-censor in the positive way of having some shorter yeah. answers to a bunch of questions. Yeah, that would be, be great. Quite a yeah, we can just go across the room. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Would you like to go first? <laughs> uh, I'm Johan, by the way. Uh, I where know, do you, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where do you draw the line in terms of um, things like symbols and particular groups that have uh, historical uh, mm -hmm. legacies that aren't the best in the country and around the world? Okay. Um, so that, that's the like question. the swastika, for example. Swastika, yeah. 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 people walk around in, in clan yep. uh, bed sheets, yep. that kind of thing. So my question is about civil What's your rights. Name, please? Uh, my name is Brian, Brian Chow. Uh, so my question is about civil rights laws, particularly the hostile work environments. Mm -hmm. So it's been used in multiple civil suits to essentially punish companies for not silencing their employees mm -hmm. on uh, political, certain topics, particularly race and sex. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you believe that civil rights laws, as they are enforced currently, mm -hmm. are are um, incompatible with free speech. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello, I'm Hi. Amy. And Can you say Amy? Amy, yeah, Hi. and I think this has been touched upon, but it seems like there's a dichotomy in free speech where we wanna limit hate speech, but we also don't want people to feel like they might get canceled if they say something outside of like the narrative. Right. Um, so I was wondering if you've seen communities that have created a space where there is like a balance between the two, other than here, and yeah. also, um, that they have the ability to like constantly like have change change each other's minds and have like strong ideas that are weekly held. Great. Maybe one more for now, and then we can take the next round. Hello, I'm Joe. Um, we Joe. Spoke, Joe. Mm -hmm. We spoke a lot about the legal case for for free speech, free speech, and I'm curious to hear. Uh, more of a moral case for mm -hmm. free speech and you mentioned uh, John Stuart Mill mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like there could be a utilitarian case mm -hmm. that could be made against free speech so I'm curious mm -hmm. to know how you come to Okay. Free speech through moral. Well thank you these are excellent questions and, and the hope that there are others I'm going to self-censor in the positive editorial way of trying to be brief so I can't. And, uh, let me say something that I should have said at the outset. If this were a class of mine or if I had the privilege uh, to teach a seminar here, I wouldn't answer your question. I would do what I did uh, with Tobias, which is ask you, what's your best answer to that question? Uh, because I feel I, my experience is that you learn best when you're thinking and you're not and hopefully you're doing that, but you have more of an incentive to do it when I'm asking you to do it aloud uh, for the benefit of the rest of us. And then I would ask others of you to chime in. So I'm short-circuiting all of that, depriving myself of the opportunity to hear your insights. Um, uh, Johan, um, symbols are a form of expression that are treated exactly the same as any other expression. Uh, and uh, therefore, if you have the right to express a racist or an anti-Semitic idea through a swastika or a um, Ku Klux Klan outfit, or I'm sorry, through, uh, through words, you also have the right to do that through the symbolic expression. That said, speech is not absolute, whether it occurs in symbolic form or whether it occurs through, through words uh, alone. So for example, uh, the Supreme Court has had cases in which it is held that Ku Klux Klan members have the right to have their own rally where they're not only wearing their regalia and engaging in horrible anti-Semitic uh, racist expression, um, but they can even burn a cross. However, 
if they are burning, and here's another case, burning the cross on the property of an African American family, that crosses the line, right? That satisfies the emergency principle. Um, and I didn't give you another uh, example of speech that satisfies it, but it's called a true threat or intimidation when the speaker intends to instill a reasonable fear on the part of the targeted audience member that they're going to be subject to violence. And let me tell you, if somebody's burning a cross on my front lawn, I certainly would feel intimidated. So, you know, it, with some symbols as well as words, um, you cannot punish them solely because of disapproval, loathing of the viewpoint. But if in a particular context, it satisfies the emergency principle, it can and should be punished. Um, Brian, um, the hostile work environment and civil rights, uh, yeah, I'd say, you know, a real problem of uh, on campus, I'm, and I'm going to use this example because I just read a really positive decision today, uh, Title IX has been um, interpreted, I think misinterpreted in a way that is going beyond the very important legitimate purpose of uh, protecting against and preventing and punishing discrimination on the basis of gender uh, to become a hate speech code in effect and punishing words um, that convey unpopular ideas and also because of the lack of due process. That's a, that's a separate problem. Uh, just um, if I can tell you, there was a very important decision that was reported today. I think it was issued a couple of days ago um, where uh, the Connecticut Supreme Court in a case that was brought by a Yale student who had been completely exonerated in both university and criminal proceedings. Uh, he was accused of, um, of, of sexual misconduct, I think actual rape, and he was exonerated. And he brought a defamation lawsuit um, against the person who had accused him. And it was a groundbreaking decision. It's a little bit tricky, because those of us who defend free speech, um, defamation can be used to, maybe it silences too much speech. But what remedy do you have if somebody is destroying your reputation? You know, not only invading your free speech and your, you know, right to be on campus, but destroying your reputation, your ability to to get a job. Uh, it's one of the only tools available, and unanimously, the Connecticut Supreme Court, which is very progressive, um, said that their Yale argued and the student argued, uh, the accusing student argued that there was absolute immunity for anything you say in a judicial proceeding, and the court said this is not a judicial proceeding and it's like 25 pages about all the violations of due process. No opportunity to cross-examine, no opportunity to be represented by counsel, no record so that you can't appeal. And these are really kangaroo courts. And I could not be more devoted to women's rights and equality and civil rights. There's, you know, I think we don't need to choose between the two. To me, this is a distortion of civil rights as well as um, of free speech. I could say a lot more, but you know, again, the devil is in the details, and unfortunately, there are a lot of deviled details in these cases. Um, Amy, if I understand it, you're asking, is there a safe space for free speech other than places like this? And yeah, you know, how do you create it? I mean, it's it is so, you know, and how do we create it even here? Um, I have to say, you know, from a faculty perspective, I remember a year and a half ago when there was the first uh, summit, I'm looking at Lauren, I think that's what we called it, uh, like a summit on first principles for some of us who are on the advisory board and, and others for University of Austin, and most of us are professors, and so many of us were commenting that it was such a relief. It was the first time we could remember where we felt completely comfortable expressing ourselves. And you almost don't realize how much you're stifling yourself until that repression is lifted off. And, and so what created the trust, which I think you have here and we had as advisors and faculty members, 
is knowing that we all share uh, a commitment to robust freedom of speech. We're all going to give each other the benefit of the doubt if somebody says something that you perceive as unkind or incivil, you're not going to assume it's because they're an evil person, right. right? You know, not only that they were evil in that moment, but they're just evil, period. I, I mean, these were principles and approaches that I think used to, throughout most of my lifetime were just accepted in general, right? We would give people the benefit of the doubt. There would be a presumption of innocence. Um, there was a desire to engage in good faith with people you disagreed with as well as agreed with. But these are matters of culture. They're not matters of law. And those of us who are involved in educational communities have to do everything we can to create that kind of culture. It's obviously something the University of Austin is doing very intentionally through governing documents, right, Lauren, and trying to create structures and systems that will um, ensure um, that kind of culture. But that's not enough. That's necessary, but not sufficient. The Chicago free speech principles are necessary, but not sufficient. What I can say, Amy and all the rest of you, is all of us have a responsibility to do what we can. You can't do it alone. You need some support. You know, I, I had a conversation with a very brave uh, Yale Law student. You may have read about him, I think, about two years ago, Trent Colbert, um, who uh, was inviting students to a party that was hosted by the Native American law students and the Federalist Society. He was the leader of both of them. And he referred to trap house, uh, a term that has a completely different connotation now from its origin. And it was never a racially discriminatory term, but apparently it had some race, racial associations in that it was u originally used for, um, for crack cocaine uh, houses and mostly patronized by people who were black. And anyway, so the people got their knickers in a twist about that. And two administrators at Yale Law School called him in and demanded that he apologize. And he said, I'm sorry if people were offended. I'm happy to talk to them individually, but I'm not going to sign this apology. And he, took, of course, um, um, photographed them, which prompted Yale to ban the photographing or taping of, of anybody, um, in which they were literally threatening that they would withhold the character and fitness recommendation that you need in order to be able to practice law, to be admitted to the bar. And how did he have the courage to withstand that pressure? As he did, and I talked to him about it, and he made two really good points, and I'd like to repeat them. Uh, one was, you have to have a small group of friends, he said it doesn't have to be large, but you, you have to trust them completely, and they have to trust you completely. So Amy, that's, you know, on a very small scale, what I would like to see permeate a larger group such as this, and hopefully the entire university community, but start small. You know, and social, he said, I couldn't have done it alone, but I didn't, as long as there was a small group of support of me, that was enough. And social psychology experiments show, you know, we've got such a pressure to conformity that people just not to be nonconformists will say things that are completely contrary to their beliefs, their perceptions, but that if one person speaks up, it becomes infinitely easier for the next one to do so. And so I'm not saying you have to be the first one, but maybe you can have a small group and let it spread from there. And there are many experiments and projects that are being taking place on many campuses uh, to try to create, you know, there, some are called bridge communities. They've got other names where people who say, we are absolutely committed to meeting with and talking with and honestly discussing 
um, controversial ideas with people from different backgrounds and different perspectives. So I think you can find that community anywhere and, and create it anywhere, and hopefully um, the ethos will spread. And then, Joe, you asked about the moral case, for uh, in which I'm not a philosopher at all. Um, but I have read many philosophers who uh, have supported free speech. And what I think is so interesting, a colleague of mine um, at FIRE, Jakob Michangama, who founded and heads a human rights um, institute based in Copenhagen and now with an outlet in the United States, uh, last or a few years ago wrote a book called From Socrates to Social Media a global history of free speech. And what's so striking about that is he shows that, you know, going back to ancient history and around the world in countries with very different governmental structures and, you know, different in every respect, there have always been people who are clamoring for and aspiring and defending free speech, There's, I mean, coupled with constant repressive pressures. Um, so there does seem to be, the, you know, the, as far as I'm concerned, First Amendment law and other sources of law are protecting uh, what I do see as a fundamental inherent human right uh, as is, um, it's conceived in the Declaration of, of Independence that you know, all of us um, have these rights by virtue of being human, and the purpose of government is not to grant the rights, but to but to secure them. And you know, Mill gives a utilitarian defense of free speech, which I, I keep coming back to. I mean, for all of its flaws and all of its shortcomings, to me, it is so much less dangerous than the alternative which is entrusting and empowering anybody else to take those decisions away from us. Do we, we have, have time, time for one more question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I always feel like that name, advocates for censorship or um, against free speech um, come from a point of, I wouldn't say intellectual weakness, mm -hmm. but at uh, but definitely from some, kind, uh, some point of intellectual insecurity mm -hmm. about their own worldview mm -hmm. and their own opinion. What is your stance on this? On this? Very interesting question. Do you mind telling me your name? Uh, my name is Lawrence. Lawrence, hi there. Um, you know, that's interesting. Uh, it's a very... I think I've always assumed it was the opposite. So you're opening my eyes, which I always appreciate. I've always thought it's an excess of certainty and self-confidence uh, that my views are right. And, 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 and these days, it's not only that my views are right in the sense of being correct, but they're right from a moral perspective. And you know, not only are you erroneous in your views, but you're an evil person uh, if you don't share my views. And that's certainly the perspective that maybe I've been too influenced by the United States Supreme Court because I'm thinking of a famous statement by, uh, in one of the great free speech decisions, uh, opinions early in our history by Oliver Wendell Holmes, in which he talked about how uh, people are always sure of their ideas. I'm so sorry I can't think of the exact language because he said it so eloquently. And that's what emboldens them uh, to insist that other ideas be, be censored. He then goes on to say, but time has upset many fighting faiths. And this is where he says that, and we have come to realize that the best test for truth is a utilitarian argument, um, is in the power of the marketplace to, uh, to debate ideas. Um, but you're, you're asking a question that is probably more psychological, that even subconsciously or unconsciously, uh, people are afraid or insecure and therefore don't want to grapple with ideas that are inconsistent with their own, don't have the 
self-confidence. And that, again, brings me back to some of the great Supreme Court language uh, from Louis Brandeis, for example, talking about uh, free and fearless people have courage to um, encounter ideas that might be dangerous or threatening or harmful. So I think that's a very um, positive way to look at it. I would just say as an advocate, I would uh, never say that. I would try not to say that to somebody who's voicing an idea, you know, to that to me would be too much of a, an ad hominem um, argument. So do I get any closing words or? Well, I was just going to say in question? closing, I would love to hear a little bit about your forthcoming book. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> that was not a plant. Um, I, uh, Oxford University Press, it turns out, so well, how this started goes back to something I said earlier, that I have come to realize that so much hostility toward free speech results from ignorance about what it is. And even though I've always separated educating about free speech as I do in my classroom from, or in, even in a place setting like this, from advocating for free speech, which I do when I testify before Congress or you know, do a debate on a TV show or so forth. Um, the two really overlap because both in my experience and survey data show that the more people know about free speech, the more supportive they become. And as this was becoming clear to me about a year and a half ago, I said to my husband, I ought to write free speech for dummies. That would go a long way toward um, you know, education, which would go a long way toward support. And I, I was talking to a friend who said, Oxford University Press has a series that it's not exactly for dummies, but you know, it's, it's the more sophisticated version for an audience that you probably care about more. And it's called What Everyone Needs to Know. And even though it's existed for almost 20 years, they do not have a book in that series about free speech, which was too bad, but it was too good in the sense that I got to write it. And it's a, in Q&A format, which is per perfect because I've basically been doing nothing for the last you know, many, many years other than answering questions about free speech. So I literally just sat down at my computer, wrote out the, uh, the questions and, and the answers, and um, I hope that it will be uh, very user-friendly and um, stimulate both knowledge about and support for free speech. But it's not to be definitive answers in the preface to the book, and I mean it very, very seriously. Um, my goal for readers, as it was always for my students and for all of my, uh, everybody with whom I'm privileged to talk as, as certainly this very special group, I want you to be able not only to answer every question, but to question every answer. So that would be my parting wish for all of you. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank